The 1990s were a wild time full of big crazy events, lots of deaths, rebirths, crossovers, launches, and covert action teams. With the launch of a new publisher called Image Comics, the industry was turned on its head as it pivoted to adjust to this new powerhouse. At the forefront of that was a new team created by Jim Lee known as the Wild Covert Action Team, the Wildcats. Let's talk about them. But before we do, thanks for watching JLS Comics. If you liked the video, hit the thumbs up and subscribe because I do upload videos just like this every week. Alright, let's jump into our story. Debuting toward the end of 1992, the Wildcats title by Jim Lee and Brandon Choi was one of the first titles out of a then-fledgling publisher, Image Comics, and Lee's new Image Comics imprint studio, Wildstorm. The title was immensely popular, selling hundreds of thousands of copies of each issue. Wildcats ran for 50 issues and then for 5 more volumes, multiple crossovers, and saw people like Alan Moore, Warren Ellis, and Chris Claremont lending their creative talent to the book. The original series, while also helping launch the industry-changing Image Comics, also helped launch a new interconnected universe. And its story is this. Eons ago, two powerful alien races were at war. The Cherubim and the Daemonites, loose analogs to cherubs, angels, and demons. Eventually, the cosmic war found its way to a little blue planetary island in the Milky Way called Earth. The Cherubim were the good side of the conflict, powerful, nearly immortal humanoid beings, and a race of peaceful, yet fierce, noble warriors. Part of the Kara society were the female warriors, a sect known as the Coda. When the Cherubim got to Earth over the years, they would mate and breed with the humans of Earth, creating hybrid beings. The Daemonites, on the other hand, were monstrous reptilian creatures who were evil and seeking to conquer planets. Daemonites have the power to inhabit a host body and control it, and this was their means of control and planetary domination. So when the Daemonites crashed to Earth centuries ago, the Daemonites immediately desired to take over Earth by taking over the bodies of humans. The Cherubim chose to defend Earth and the humans from the Daemonite threat. Both factions were led by lords, primarily on the Daemonite side, Lord Hellspawn, and on the Kara side, Lord Emp. A Coda warrior named Zana, she'd later change her name to Zealot, was one of the aliens who crashed to Earth and she would train other female warriors, giving rise to the legend of the Amazonian warriors, mythological wonder women. Lord Amp and his brother Lord Entropy also continued to fight against the Daemonites through the Crusades, the Dark Ages, through the World Wars, to the modern era. And as the world evolved into the modern age, Lord Amp took on the name and the persona of Jacob Marlowe. And Jacob Marlowe started working with the United States government. In fact, he helped to found a Team One, which helped to insert some of the Caribou lineage into Black Ops and the intelligence community. He also began to work with Miles Craven, who would become the Director of International Operations, a covert directorate developing gen-active bioweapons through later iterations of Jack's Team 1, such as Team 7 and the Gen 12. An activated gen-active gene is what gives people superpowers in this universe. Unfortunately, in a battle with a Daemonite lord named Hightower, a rival lord to Lord Hellspawn, Amp suffered a case of amnesia and forgot who he was for many years, and he became a vagrant and homeless in the streets. A Russian cosmonaut in the summer of 1980 named Adriana Tereskova was aboard a space station when it was hit with alien space debris. Adriana was struck with an orb of power and transformed into a teleporting being named Void. Eventually, Void found Marlowe, pulled him off the streets and cured him of his amnesia and helped him amass a fortune which he partly used to found a company and a new team called the Wildcats which he would task with taking the fight right to the Daemonites. Marlowe and Void recruited Zealot to the team. They also found Dr. Jeremy Stone, aka Maul, who'd be the team's tank. The stronger Maul got, though, the lower his intelligence became to a point where he could become uncontrollable both by others and himself. Marlowe also recruited a human Caribum hybrid who was also an artist named Reno Bryce who took the name Warblade and who could make any part of his body into an edged weapon. His entire body was literally a weapon. He also brought on a cyborg named Spartan, an empathic cyborg who was designed after a Kara line of Hadrian cybernetic beings that were brought to Earth. Spartan would take on multiple identities like Hadrian, John Colt, and Jack Marlowe, the quote-unquote nephew to Jacob Marlowe. Void told Marlowe that they need to find someone with a gift called the Sight in order to stop the Daemonites from starting their project reunification. So they went to a strip club and found a lethal female exotic dancer named Voodoo who, with the Sight, could detect Daemonites hiding inside of human hosts. So they recruited the stripper to the team. He also recruited Grifter, whom he'd been aware of through the Black Ops teams of the past and who had also been trained by Zealot. In fact, it was Grifter who was at the club who was trying to bring Voodoo on board for the team. 
Hellspont was now the leader of a unit called the Cabal, which consisted of Pike, Providence, Hestia, and Devon, and who were to help Lord Hellspont bring a Daemonite armada to Earth, which was Project Reunification. They needed the Orb of Power inside of Void, the one that she got during her space station accident, and they need to get a Daemonite as well inside of the United States Vice President, which was Dan Quayle at the time, which dates the story. But going after a Daemonite possessed VP put the Wildcats in direct contention with a government sponsored team created by Rob Liefeld known as Young Blood. So Void transported the team away from that battle with Young Blood, but John Lynch, who was now the director of international operations, detected the signal of the warp and tracked the Wildcats ship to a ship called MERV, an acronym meaning a multi-purpose intercept reconnaissance vehicle. So Lynch sent one of his black ops teams called Black Razor 1 after the Wildcats. The fighting was also being monitored by an arms dealer named the Gnome as he sought out the ore for himself too. So there are many facets to this conflict. Then the team ran into Ripclaw and Cyberforce, another image team, but this one was created by Mark Silvestri for a crossover called Killer Instinct. On the Skywatch space station orbiting above Earth, Stormwatch was watching as those two teams clashed. After this battle, the team went for some much needed R&R. Grifter and Zell spent their downtime in a bar shooting pool and drinking beer and getting in bar fights. And Warblade and Maul went to pick up some women at an art gallery in Soho in New York. While Voodoo and Spartan went on a cruise with Marlow, which is when they ran into Marlow's brother Entropus, aka Lord Entropy. As a funny easter egg, Clark Kent and Lois Lane were on the cruise ship in the background, as well as Scott Summers and Jean Grey, Cyclops and Marvel Girl of the X-Men, who had just gotten married in their own title around the same time at their own publisher. It wasn't official, just some background fun. By issue 10, as Jim Lee was coming off the title, Chris Claremont was coming onto the book. This issue found Zella trying to teach Voodoo how to fight, which is when they saw a seafaring vessel explode and a guy named Alabaster Wu fall off the bow. So they went to the ship to investigate, and Zella found a girl named Miranda Ty and her bodyguard named the Huntsman. This beast on the vessel named Raksha ended up possessing Voodoo. And the Raksha possessed Voodoo contacted Wildcats and told them that Alabaster Wu wanted to kill Marlo. So Void teleported the Wildcats in and they fought with Harm, Slag, and Attica in a villain team called the Triad that it turns out were working for another villain named Tapestry along with Lord Soma. And then there was a whole bunch of these Raksha beasts as well. Later, as the team prepared for a vacation, the team fought briefly with the Freak Force in Chicago, which also pulled in Savage Dragon, who later Marlo brought both Wildcats and Freak Force to his island for that vacation they were trying to go on. So they fought, but then they ended up becoming friends. In 1995, the Wildcats battled with Stormwatch. While they fought, Hellspont was trying to collect keys to access a Daemonite ship that had the power to destroy Earth. In a big plot twist, the space vessel turned out to be a Caribum ship and not Daemonite as everyone thought at first. And it seemed as though the ship was destroyed, killing the Wildcats team, but they warp jumped out into space and traveled to the Caribum homeworld of Kara. In issue 20, after Marlow made a deal with Hightower, Grifter decided to quit the team entirely angry at them for striking a deal with the guy who had killed one of his friends. In the next issue, Alan Moore was writing Wildcats. This is where Wildcats became two teams. One was on Kara and one was back on Earth, led by Mr. Majestic and Majestic's daughter Savant, who thought the original team were all deceased. Mr. Majestic was once a Karen warlord, born on Kara as Majestros. At one point, he mated with the Dakota warrior Lady Zana, who we know as Zealot, and their progeny came to be Savant. As a Superman analog with a more militant code of ethics than old soups, Majestic was immensely powerful. He also recruited a cyborg lady named Ladytron, and a guy created by scientists who can manipulate willpower, whose name is Tao, along with Cole Cash, Grifter's brother, Max Cash, who was now calling himself Condition Red. It turns out that Tao was a villain in manipulating the team into a gang war. On the planet Kara, that team at first thought that everything was now copacetic and utopian, that the war between the Caribum and Daemonite was over, and that peace had been finally achieved. However, it turned out to be a dystopian society, and that social stratification was ruining a society run by greedy, deviant, power-hungry politicians. So this off-world Wildcats team then headed back to Earth, and everybody except Lord Amp and Voodoo joined Mr. Majestic's Earth-based Wildcats team. Voodoo was disillusioned with Wildcats, so she decided to go study Voodoo in New Orleans. And Amp, as I said, was disillusioned as well. And this happened after he had seen what had become of his people on Kara, and he no longer desired to fight for them. Shortly afterwards, Grifter took the Wildcats to an island called Gomorrah to help both Gen 13 and Deathblow. Tau fought with Majestic and the team and managed to rip out Ladytron's nuclear core. Majestic had to cut Ladytron in half to take out the core and fly it up into space where it blew up safely. 
Majestic survived the blast and returned to Earth, where he ended up killing Tao and stopping the war. So Majestic killed Tao seemingly, but it turns out that he actually killed a shape-changing guy named Mr. White who had taken on Tao's form. Big plot twist. Then a guy named Crusade attacked and neither Majestic nor Union could defeat him. If it wasn't for Void teleporting people to space and later to Antarctica, Crusade might have actually won. The fallout though from the battle is that Savant completely quit the team to form a new team called Savant Guard. And Zell had had Majestic follow her and he stopped at the church of Gort where he found Lady Tron and her newly rebuilt legs. So Lady Tron was back. After this, Max Cash changed his name to Max Prophet and joined the Puritans and started hooking up with a Puritan named Gina de Medici. The Puritans were a villainous group who wanted to wipe both the Daemonites and the Cherubim from Earth. To do this, they concocted a plot, possibly after watching Arnold and Terminator. They wanted to go back in time to kill them before all these aliens started inserting themselves, in more ways than one, into human civilization. Max told the Wildcats of the Puritans' plan, and so he rejoined Wildcats, and they all went in back in time to stop the Puritans. This new team was Max, Void, Max's brother Grifter, and Spartan, along with a Caribbean lord named Mythos, a Coda-trained Daemonite named Olympia, and a former nun who was Lord Entropy's daughter named Sister Eve, although she died in an avalanche while protecting this team. The battle through time brought them to the point where the aliens first crashed on Earth, and Max stole Gina's time travel device, which left her there at that point in time centuries before she was born. So Gina, in the past, joined up with the Dakota warriors and had them kill Max as time passed up into the future, and this was as revenge. But then Olympia killed the assassin, which caused Spartan to kick her off of the Wildcats team. Also in this last issue, Voodoo returned to the Wildcats just before they were disbanded. In 1996, Alan Moore wrote a crossover story between Spawn and the Wildcats. In the distant future, Spawn had become evil after he'd killed Malbulger and basically took over Hell and was now trying to conquer the world. So the future Wildcats traveled to the past to try to stop him. It was a strange story where some of the Wildcats are dead, some are slaves of the Hell Lord, and others are sex slaves. Shocking, but kind of an on-brand trope for Alan Moore. In 1997, Wildcats met Marvel's X-Men. Each issue of this miniseries was named after an age. The Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Modern Age, and the Dark Age. In Golden Age, Wolverine and Zealot were in Nazi Germany. In Silver Age, Grifter was working for Nick Fury as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent fighting the Brood, a xenomorphic alien species, and Daemonite hybrid creatures. Modern Age had the Wildcats meet the X-Men as they were both investigating the Hellfire Club. The Dark Age took place in a future wasteland where Daemonites had taken over the Sentinels and destroyed everything, so some X-Men and some Wildcats were left to fight in a very Days of Future Past story that involved time travel and a nuclear bomb in New York City. Also in 1997, Grant Morrison had DC Comics' JLA meet the Wildcats. The Justice League were fighting a villain named Epic, the Lord of Time, through, well, time. Lots of time travel around this time period. All of Epic's time jumping caused DC and the Wildstorm universes to overlap, and so the JLA ended up meeting the Wildcats even before DC Comics would purchase Wildstorm two years later. In 1998, Warren Ellis crossed Wildcats over with the Xenomorphs of Aliens, remember I mentioned the Brood, who were stuck on a Stormwatch space station called Skywatch. Grifter had confused the Xenomorphs and Daemonites, and so they shot up to Skywatch to help. Back in the main title, Zealot would later leave the team to help form a new team called Wildcore, along with Backlash and Taboo. Then, in 1998, Jim Lee sold his Wildstorm Productions, and with it, the Wildcats team, to DC Comics. And so, in 1999, DC Comics introduced a new title with a creative team of Scott Lobdell and Travis Cherist. This new team was Lord Emp, Grifter, Spartan, and Noir, and they sought to battle with a villain named Kenyon. Kenyon was once a human whom Emp had granted immortality eons ago. Early in the run, Zealot was apparently killed, and so the team disbanded once again, but wasn't permanent. Later, Lord Emp started evolving his form in a process known as Ascension. To fully realize his new form, Amp would need to be killed, and so he asked Kenyon to kill him, to rid him of his human body. Instead, Kenyon said no, killed himself, and so Amp then asked Spartan to do the deed, which Spartan did. And so this is when the team took a break. Void had given up her soul in issue 13, and Grifter went off to find and bring back Lady Tron. This is also when Spartan, now calling himself Jack Marlowe, took over as de facto leader of Wildcats and used all of Marlowe's funds to invest in Halo Corporation. And that's when this murderous supervillain named Slaughterhouse Smith showed up to track down Marlowe for revenge. He killed Lady Tron, cut Voodoo's legs off, and also blinded Maul, so Marlowe is Spartan and Grifter had to take him on, and this is when Agent Wax came on board. Later, Noir wanted to make some money, so he tried to use extra-dimensional technology to make a battery that never runs out. But for it to work, he would need to kill Spartan, so Noir rebuilt Lady Tron and wanted her to kill Spartan for him. 
but Lady Tron couldn't kill Spartan, and so later, Spartan ended up killing Noir. The battery technology, though, would then go on to make the Halo Corporation under Spartan a global corporate superpower with immense wealth that would bankroll them into the future. Wildcats 3.0 took a more mature turn, introducing a new grifter and his BDSM muscle called the Beef Boys. The story changed focus and was now more about Spartan trying to use the Halo Corporation and their technology to better Earth, and it was less about superheroes fighting supervillains and beating back alien hordes, and it was a greatly pared down roster, mainly Spartan, Agent Orange, Agent Wax, Grifter, and the new Grifter named Edwin Dolby. In issue 24 of that series, Zealot came back to the team after being out on her own. The team in 2006's Wildcats Nemesis by Robbie Morrison consisted of Mr. Majestic, Savant, Grifter, and Zealot. The miniseries introduced Lady Karis as Nemesis to Wildcats lore. Lady Karis was a powerful psychic Karen from a slave-like strata of the Karen caste system who had met Mr. Majestic on Kara and ended up sleeping with him. Nemesis wields these dual blades that were forged in the creation engine, enabling them to slice through any material in the cosmos. Grant Morrison wrote the sole issue of the fourth volume with art by Jim Lee, and the new team was Spartan, Grifter, Voodoo, Savant, Zealot, and Ladytron with Mr. Majestic coming on board as well. Volume 5 debuted in 2008 and lasted until the end of 2010 with a total of 30 issues. The World's End event in Armageddon of 2008 brought the Wildcats, the Authority, Stormwatch, and Gen 13 together in a massive event to prevent the end of the world as foretold by Void. And during this line-wide event, the Wildcats team was the original roster along with Lady Tron and Backlash's daughter Jody, who is now calling herself Backlash as well. The world did basically end due to Nemesis and Tau being evil again. The team came back together, although most everything was destroyed. Halo's tech allowed the Wildcats to keep going on while many superpowered beings emerged during this time. After Armageddon, Voodoo came back to the team and rekindled her relationship with Spartan to the point that he proposed marriage to her. Majestic was back too, wanting to recreate Kara on Earth, which he did, and he established Kara in Hawaii. But after this, the Wildstorm universe all but ended, and some characters continued on in the DC universe like Grifter and Fairchild of Gen 13, but very sporadic. In 2017, The Wildstorm, written by Warren Ellis, was a new imagining of the Wildstorm universe with appearances by greatly different versions of Grifter, Zealot, Voodoo, Amp, and others. Then a writer named Freddie Williams II pitched a revival of Wildcats to DC Comics, which would have seen Grifter teaming up with Batman, Robin, Deathstroke, Deathblow, Zealot, and John Lynch but this pitch was rejected. In 2019, a reboot of Wildcats by Warren Ellis was announced, but that too was cancelled. Well, not cancelled, but postponed, with the solicitation being taken off the calendar after the creative team missed their deadlines. This book was intended as a follow-up to that 24-issue Wildstorm run, also by Warren Ellis that I just mentioned. Lately, in the wake of Joker War, Grifter has been seen in DC's Batman title, now working as Lucius Fox's bodyguard. So, could that postponed series be far behind? Is Wayne Enterprises going to take on the Halo Corporation in Gotham? We shall see. Because the team was so immensely popular, selling hundreds of thousands of copies in the, of issues in the 1990s, Wildstorm branched out into other media. Playmates created a line of action figures in 1994, and the same year, there was a short-lived animated series as part of CBS's Action Zone block that lasted a mere 13 episodes, and it focused on the original team, but made it a bit more family-friendly. Voodoo, for example, wasn't a stripper in the show. In 1995, Playmates Interactive and Nintendo made a video game for the SNES platform. I never played it, so I don't know how good it was, though, but apparently you could only play as Spartan, Maul, or Warblade. Anyhow, that's the story of the Wildcats as of the winter 2020, with hopefully much more to come. Until then, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this each and every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.